everyone. Uh, my name is Anka Bulgaro. I'm a medical oncologist at Smilo in Waterford. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for a celebration of the breast cancer survivors um, on March 8th. That is the International Women's Day. This is a global celebration that celebrates um, the achievement of women on the cultural, social, economic, and political um, areas. It's also a call for gender equality. Imagine a gender equal world free of biases, stereotypes, and discrimination. I think each year, um, International Women's Day has a theme, and this year's theme is Break the Bias. The best way to explain what biases are, are through the words of the poet Anissa Randalawa. And this is a video that I took from the International Women's Day uh, website. Bias is a war. Every word is a brick. Saliva is cement hardening the way that we think about gender or a group of people. A wall that separates us from the fact that we are all equal. An empowered girl is a hurricane that can paint the world in sunsets. Bias is a wall that tries to stop her, but her hurricane isn't done yet. An empowered girl can lead the world into change and she can guide us into a place that's new. This is a poem to you. Let's break the bias. There are many biases that women um, diagnosed with breast cancer face. Uh, a diagnosis of the breast cancer can be an identity threat to, um, to the person who, who gets such a diagnosis. It could affect her um, well-being and her ability to function in her family um, or at the workplace. So there are many uh, challenges and issues that breast cancer survivors face um, dealing with the physical and emotional scars of the breast cancer diagnosis and treatment. Today, we uh, gathered a great panel of speakers to talk about how to break those biases, how to challenge the um, um, stereotypes, how to trans knock down that wall of biases and uh, change it into steps that we can uh, take to improve the quality of life and functioning of the breast cancer survivors. I will introduce the uh, panelists. Uh, first, um, uh, Carrie Fijel, nurse practitioner at Smilo um, Waterford, will talk about um, general issues that breast cancer survivors face and how we approach them in a multidisciplinary fashion. The keynote presentation will be given by the illustrious team of Dr. Mary Jane Minkin and uh, Joanna Dadario, physician assistant, who are part of the um, um, SIMS clinic, um, sexuality, intimacy, and menopause clinic uh, uh, through Yale New Haven Hospital and Smilo Cancer Center. They both are champions in women's health and um, they have helped our uh, survivors um, making a tremendous difference in, in their lives. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, we will end Kathy uh, with um, a, a talk by Kathy McCarthy, our social worker from Smilo Waterford, who will talk about um, how to cope emotionally um, with uh, after a diagnosis of breast cancer and during the survivorship phase. Um, at the end, we will have a question and answer uh, session. You could um, type your questions in the chat and we will answer them at the end. So without uh, 
um, further ado, I think we can um, give the, uh, let Carrie take it away. I would like to say that Carrie is a, a fantastic nurse practitioner. We are so happy to have her part of our team at Smilo in Waterford. Um, she has been involved in the care of um, breast cancer patients, but not only breast cancer, um, throughout all the phases from the diagnosis, taking care of them during the acute phase of treatment. She is also um, one of the leaders in the survivorship team. And um, we offer a survivorship visit to um, all patients finishing their uh, active treatment. So thank you very much, Carrie, for being here and take it away. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, I'm just gonna get to my screen here. Start sharing. And okay. So, um, so as Dr. Bulgaro said, um, I'm Carrie Fiegel. I am a nurse practitioner at Smilo Waterford. I um, some of you who are watching may have already met me in person many times. Um, but, um, I also do the survivorship uh, visits. Um, so I just wanted to go over. Uh, so the survivorship clinic that we have in Waterford and also um, some uh, breast cancer statistics and uh, potential uh, side effects uh, that uh, we try to um, help everyone with. Um, we have, okay, so here, um, just some breast cancer statistics, um, lots of words here. I apologize for all the wordiness, um, but so breast cancer is the most common cause of cancer in women, um, aside from skin cancer. It is about 30% uh, of all new female uh, cancers every year, which is about one in three. Uh, breast cancer mainly occurs in middle-aged um, and older women um, with a uh, median age of about 62 years of age. However, um, we are seeing more women uh, diagnosed with breast cancer that are uh, younger than 49. Um, the uh, overall risk of uh, the, uh, the average risk for women uh, to develop breast cancer in her lifetime is around 13%. Um, so that equals one in eight chance uh, that a woman will develop breast cancer. Um, it is the second leading cause of cancer death in women. Um, and the chance that a woman will die from breast cancer equals uh, about 2.6%. Um, over the last 30 years, uh, breast cancer death rates have been steadily declining. Um, and I will show you a nice graphic to depict that in a moment. Um, and this is believed to uh, be the result of finding breast cancer earlier through screening, increased awareness, um, and uh, better treatment options. Um, so that means increased survival rates. Um, currently at this time, there are more than 3.8 million breast cancer survivors in the United States. And this includes women that are currently going through treatment and those who have also completed treatment. Carrie, we don't see your slides advancing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there we go, okay. So just here are some uh, graphs. Um, so this is showing age of diagnosis. Oh, I'm getting some feedback. Sorry on my end, guys. If, um, if I'm not coming across. We can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's oh, okay. Okay, sorry about that. Technical difficulties. So um, here again, median age of diagnosis is the middle age group of women. Um, 
so less in the younger group um, and as you get older the higher risk of developing breast cancer but again like i said we are seeing more uh, younger women um, diagnosed um, and this just shows that over this all the way back to 1930 um, up until 2019 um, so it just shows this lovely steady decline in death rates um, with breast cancer patients um, this is just a graph showing um, five-year survival rates. Um, this first line is of all stages of breast cancer combined, 90% um, survival rate. Um, localized breast cancer uh, has the highest, of course, 99% um, survival rate. Regional breast cancer, so it's spread you know, into you know, lymph nodes, for instance, 86%. And then distant, um, the more uh, stage four cancer is a 29% survival rate. Um, and then this graph is just showing um, the prevalence of uh, survivorship uh, of people just surviving cancer and the different age groups um, so over the years. Oh, I mean, it's just everyone in all age groups is really just uh, surviving cancer for longer periods of time. Um, so phases of survivorship. Um, there are uh, a bunch of different ones. And again, this is a little lengthy slide with um, a lot of information that I'm going to also talk about. But there's the acute uh, phase extended long term and then the very special group of um, patients who have stage four metastatic disease um, and just to kind of briefly go through these different phases of survivorship on um, the acute phase is um, during treatment so you it's during di you've been diagnosed you're going through treatment and some things that you might be dealing with um, or struggling with you know fear anxiety um, dealing with the diagnosis um and confronting one's own mortality um the extended stage of a survivorship is after you've completed your treatment um and you might have fear of cancer recurrence um and then lots of other things that uh you could be experiencing um causing you know, distress, struggling with physical and psychosocial issues, um, having to learn to cope in different ways. Um, unlike the acute phase where the struggles are you know, more uniform, predictable, um, you know, side effects associated with treatment, um, extended phase can be more variable. Um, and everyone's response you know, can uh, vary greatly. Um, you can feel isolated. There can be feelings of devastation, depression, or just minor disruption and some minor anxiety, or some people, um, you know, don't uh, have any of these uh, distressing symptoms at all. Um, and, you know, this, the, the part of, um, the survivorship clinic, one of the, you know, the goals in our, our role is to kind of, you know, normalize um, everyone's, you know, uh, where, you know, when I meet with someone, I want, we always say we want to meet you where you're at. So, you know, and, and normalize your experience and what you're feeling, what you're going through. These are all normal things um, and uh, the last uh, the last phase before I get to the stage four um, long-term phase of survivorship um, this is you know very low risk for cancer recurrence at this phase um, but you may continue to face you know long-term um, late side effects from um, different types of treatment that you've gone through um, as stage four metastatic uh, breast cancer survivors. So this is a special group of, of patients who um, basically, you know, we consider this as having a 
chronic disease, um, like diabetes, for instance. Um, but you know, there is still a, a lot of uncertainty that they can struggle with. Um, advances in immunotherapy and targeted therapies have led to significant improvements in survival outcomes for this group of patients. Um, but again, also faced with different and unique challenges um, because um, you know, they are you know, uh, still living with um, a stage four cancer that is you know, uh, going to be a chronic disease for them. Um, this slide kind of just um, goes over different treatment-related side effects. So depending on the type of treatment you've received, um, whether it's surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, um, hormonal therapy, um, many of the potential side effects that can occur um, can kind of, you know, intertwine and um, overlap one another. Some are acute during treatment, some are late after treatment. Um, and one, another goal of the survivorship clinic is um, we want to be able to identify and manage potential side effects effectively and with the goal of improving the quality of life for our patients. So supporting um, the journey to wellness is kind of, you know, our, um, our overall theme. Um, when you come in for a survivorship visit uh, with uh, me or Dr. Bolero, um, we go over your cancer treatment summary, which is a survivorship care plan, which I will show um, an example of that in a moment. Um, we identify and manage late and long-term effects associated with the breast cancer and its treatment, discuss surveillance guidelines for breast cancer um, recurrence, and discuss guidelines to screen for other types of cancers. Um, we talk about healthy lifestyle changes, health maintenance issues to promote health and wellness. We provide support through a multidisciplinary team approach. And um, the approach is individualized. So we will focus on the needs of every survivor because every survivor's needs are, are going to vary greatly for whatever they have, um, they've gone through and whatever um, is, uh, you know, they're struggling with um, the day that they come in to talk with us. Um, so this is, this is a survivorship care plan. It's obviously blank to uh, uh, not uh, give any, you know, violate any HIPAA information, but all of this here would be filled in. Um, all of your people that would be taking care of you, your care team, your medical oncologist, surgeon, radiation oncologist, gynecologist, primary care provider. And um, then it goes into diagnostic information regarding your um, cancer from the pathology from surgery and all of the treatments that you might have received, whether it's chemotherapy or radiation or hormonal therapy. Um, and this is just one page out of the survivorship care plan, which actually in reality is more like eight pages long. So it's a, it's a lengthy discussion that we talk about everything in, in great detail, um, but it's tailored um, for the potential needs of that specific patient um, detailing all of the treatment received. Um, and this, you get a, the, the patient, the survivor gets a copy of this um, at the visit then a copy also is posted into my chart. Um, and then also a copy is sent to the primary care provider. Um, so they are aware of all the treatment that you've received and potential things to look out for, late effects um, that they would need to help monitor with um, and all the recommendations for screening guidelines. 
Another thing that we talk about in survivorship is, of course, you know, healthy eating and exercising and being active. Um, we do have a uh, registered to actually two registered dietitians now um, at Isla Waterford that are amazing and incredibly helpful with all of this. Um, and then all of the uh, multidisciplinary referrals um, that we are able to um, make, being that we are in Waterford um, at a care center, um, you know, we don't have you know, everything obviously on site. So a lot of our referrals are you know, sent out, um, but if any, anything comes up in our conversation during the survivor visit, these are just, you know, examples of referrals that we can make um, for you. Um, so genetic counseling, fertility counseling, contraception, sexuality, intimacy, menopause clinic, which you're going to hear a lot about in the moment, um, social work and behavioral health, which you will also hear about in a moment, um, integrative medicine, sleep medicine, physical therapy, um, which includes treatment for lymphedema. Um, registered dietitian, neurology, pain management, smoking, cessation, financial and legal counseling. So we have all of those resources uh, locally. And then to touch upon what Dr. Minkin and Joanna are going to be talking about, um, sexuality and adult cancer survivors, just a little graphic here. It's just kind of going over challenges um, that um, our survivors can face um, from you know, all different avenues, biologic, interpersonal, psychological, social, uh, social and cultural, um, and all you know, cancer-related sexual problems um, because of all of these different types of things. So all, lots of multifactorial issues that um, can affect sexuality. Um, and I just wanted to quickly just define um, sexuality and intimacy because I feel like uh, I actually had to do a little research on this and find really good um, uh, definitions because the, uh, it, it, it varies. Um, and every, I feel like everyone has their own, you know, kind of concept of or idea of what sexuality means and what intimacy means. Um, so the Two definitions that I found, um, I'm just gonna read them verbatim. Um, sexually defined by the World Health Organization um, is a central aspect of being human throughout life and encompass, encompasses sex, gender, identities, and roles, sexual orientation, eroticism, pleasure, intimacy, and reproduction. Sexuality is experienced and expressed in thoughts, fantasies, desires, uh, beliefs, attitudes, values, behaviors, practices, roles, and relationships. While sexuality can include all of these dimensions, not all of them are always experienced or expressed. Sexuality is influenced by the interaction of biological, psychological, social, economic, political, cultural, ethical, legal, historical, religious, and spiritual factors. So super. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that was yeah. quite the definition. Quite the definition, but it just, and, uh, to me, it's just yeah. like sexuality is it's a huge topic and there's and, so uh, much uh, to it and it's so yeah. important. Um, so um, thank you very much. I think that that was a perfect segue into <laughs> introducing um, Dr. Um, Mary Jane Minkin <laughs> and Joanna Daddario for their presentation. Absolutely. Um, um, definitely, there are a lot of challenges that women face uh, during their um, treatment, most of them on anti hormonal therapy. So, thank you very much, Dr. Minkin and Joanna, for being here. Thank you, Carrie, for your introduction. So, um, if you could. Um, Take it away. Thank you.
Joanna, are you in, are you in charge here, or should I? You're going to go ahead. <laughs> I'm happy to introduce you, Dr. Minkin. And Dr. Minkin is so humble, she will not tell you that she is the menopause expert in our area and our community. And, and she just is brilliant and I've learned everything from her. So Dr. Minkin, I'll let you start and talk about um, menopause in our, in our cancer survivors. Uh, well, uh, Joanna is way too kind and uh, Joanna runs the clinic. So she's in charge. I am there by courtesy of Joanna. And I get the opportunity to talk a little bit about menopause, which is, of course, the most important topic in the world. We know that. Well, sexuality is pretty much right up there, too. So I'm going to start with some of the menopause, as I always talk about, nuts and bolts as far as what's going on. And uh, Joanna will uh, take over on the other important aspect of the sexuality. First of all, what is menopause? Well, basically, Joanna, she makes me make it sound nice here, a decline in production of hormones produced by our ovaries. I just say it's the pooping out of our ovaries. Now, our ovaries can poop out by a whole bunch of different mechanisms. And you see this lovely picture here of the female reproductive tract. And menopause can happen naturally. I mean, the ovaries sort of are sort of planned obsolescence. The average age for the ovaries to poop out in women is about 51. That's sort of average in the United States. Um, but the range of normal actually for spontaneous menopause, I tell folks, is about 35 to 60. So it can happen anywhere in that point, and there are a whole bunch of different factors that can contribute to it. Now, of course, there's surgical menopause when the ovaries are taken out um, and they're not there anymore functioning. Uh, and again, that can happen again at any age. Um, and of course, before menopause, that will produce you know, a, a surgical menopause. There are chemical menopause, and of course, that is, refers to, of course, what we're talking about the loss of ovarian function through chemotherapy, most classically, um, or uh, other anti-ovarian activities. Now, one other that we don't have up here um, isn't so quite so important in uh, talking about breast cancer survivors, but is radiation therapy. And we deal with that a lot in women who are having who are dealing with gynecological cancers, uh, and radiation therapy can be responsible for the ovaries to stop working. So we have all these things which can lead to cessation of ovarian function. Um, now. Uh, Joanna, can we have the next slide here? Um, how does it affect women? Well, basically, there are a lot of symptoms of menopause. And what's going to sound amazing to some of you, you're going to say, well, of course, all of these can be symptoms of menopause, but some of them are more classically related to menopause than they are to, say, aging, which can also contribute to them. Hot flashes and night sweats certainly are the sort of arch-typical symptom that we experience. Um, in, and I'm going to say in the United States, and some of you may say, what do you mean? Women are women. Women are women all over the world. The answer is yes, women are women all over the world. We're here on International Women's Day. But the thing is that menopausal symptoms can vary from people in one country, and it can vary from women in one country to another. So for example, in the United States, hot flashes and night sweats are the most common symptoms women experience during uh, menopause. However, if I, as I always say, if I were giving this lecture in the Philippines right now, you see that we get to joint achiness way down on the list here. Well, joint achiness is actually the number one symptom women in the Philippines experience. So I, I don't know why. If you can figure that out, you get a Nobel Prize and a free trip to Stockholm. But it does it is different. And the other thing is, even within one country, if you look at the United States, for example, and we know this from a very elegant study called the SWAN study, or study of women across the nation, that, for example, African-American women seem to carry the highest burden of, of hot flashes and night sweats, Caucasian women in the middle, women of Asian backgrounds the least. Do we know why? No, we don't know why. So here I am in 2022, and I can't even tell you why some of these symptoms vary, but they do. Emotional and cognitive changes, very, very common. People get uh, anxiety with menopause. People can get some depressive changes. And classically, those can happen uh, early on in the perimenopausal stage, which is the time leading up to menopause when women will notice irregular periods, things of that nature, but the periods haven't pooped out totally at that point. Um, now, again, one of the other issues is we go look at sleep disruption, but I might even say sleep disruption even can be a bigger factor because when you don't sleep well at night, do you feel great the next day? Not usually. And can you have cognitive changes? You don't remember things so well or emotional changes? Yeah. And is that a direct effect of the loss of estrogen or is it a factor that we're not sleeping well at night? Well, they both can contribute and we can show that they both have an effect there. 
change in sex drive certainly can happen. Um, and again, we also see vaginal dryness or pain, uh, pain in the vagina from the dryness. Uh, and of course, if you're uncomfortable having sex, well, that too will contribute to a change in your sex drive. Um, Joanna knows I always refer to my, uh, I had a wonderful experience in my life having the opportunity to work with Dr. Ruth Westheimer. Um, and uh, I gave some lectures with Dr. Westheimer. She was the sex therapist and I was the gynecologist talking to groups of women throughout the United States. And uh, Dr. Uh, Westheimer got very mad at me when I commented during one of our first lectures together that I said, well, only a crazy person would want to have sex if it hurts. And Dr. Ruth looked at me and said, Mary Jane, you shouldn't say crazy person. And I said, but Dr. Ruth, I said, would it be normal to want to have sex if it hurts? And she looked at me, she said, well, no. And I said, well, you know, so the key thing is that pain with sex can often make women have a decreased sex drive, but they may have a decreased sex drive for other reasons too. The bladder is attached to the vagina and it contains the same kind of what we call receptors to estrogen as the vagina does. So the bladder can also suffer when the estrogen levels go down, when the vagina is getting dry, the bladder is getting dry, and it can be more prey to being infected or having discomfort. So bladder symptoms can certainly occur. The joint achiness I alluded to already, and indeed many women, they, they'll go, they'll you know, age 51, stop having periods and start feeling achy as anything. And they'll, somebody will think that they have, oh, that they'll have lupus or rheumatoid arthritis and stuff like that, when really what they got is menopause. And that's a problem. So, and indeed, one thing that we'll allude to also in talking about some survivorship issues is that many women who have some issues with certain of the uh, oncology medications, um, such as an aromatase inhibitor, also experience significant joint achiness, probably from the lowering of the estrogen levels. Weight fluctuations. For most people, unfortunately, it's weight going up, not weight going down, unfortunately. Um, and that this can be a, a phenomenon associated with menopause. And of course, bone loss, although it doesn't present classically with symptomatology, the achiness is not bone loss. But us women can lose bone, women can develop osteoporosis as they go through menopause, and certainly after it's been there for a while. And this is a very, very common problem. And of course, many women will complain of dry skin, and many women will complain complain of hair changes, drier hair, or even loss of hair, which can happen. So all of these fabulous symptoms can happen to women going through menopause. Um, and the problem is many of these symptoms can be accelerated when menopause is brought on abruptly. So if a woman, for example, is undergoing chemotherapy, um, that that can hit her very quickly. Uh, and she may experience these things suddenly, or if she's put on a medication, which is designed to bring on menopause, um, that these symptoms can happen very, very quickly. So these are, are potential significant problems. Okay, we have the next one. Thank you. And for consideration for breast cancer survivors, of course, it can affect women of all ages. And I'm sure we have folks on the call here, very, very young women and much older women. Um, and the, again, the treatments can, can cause or they can worsen these symptoms, as I alluded to already. Uh, things like chemotherapy, um, ovarian suppression, which are the drugs that some of you are familiar with, things like um, Lupron or Elgard, uh, which basically I, I call it sort of menopause in a jar because that they basically can lead to a sort of a chemical menopause from these medications. And then endocrine therapy, what we're talking about there are things that suppress either estrogen activity in the body or suppress the actual manufacture of estrogen, as in aromatase inhibitors cause the low of the manufacturing, whereas a drug like tamoxifen sort of blocks the activity of um, estrogen on certain tissues. Um, hormone therapy, estrogen therapy is what we're talking about here, is usually not recommended to manage menopause symptoms in breast cancer survivors. Um, and in general, we rely on non-hormonal and herbal remedies to take care of the symptoms. But the good news is we got a lot of stuff that's available. So, you know, if you're getting hot flashes and night sweats, we may not be able to give you estrogen, but we got a lot of other options. And so, for example, um, and Joanna found these lovely cute pictures, which I think are great. Um, there are lifestyle modifications and you see the nice lady who's got a fan there and we have a lot of our women coming in with fans and that's okay. Dressing in layers, it sounds easy to think about but some people don't. And so what's nice about dressing in layers is you should wear a shell at all times. And then on top of that, if it's cold out, wear a sweater because then if you start getting hot, getting hot flashes and you're in a meeting, you can nicely in, with dignity take off your sweater and have a lovely shell underneath. 
and sounds simple, but some people don't think about it. Um, cooling pillows are great. And we talked about women getting up in the middle of the night, night sweats. Well, cooling pillows actually can lower your temperature, particularly around your head. And hot flashes tend to be a phenomenon of the upper body in general. So the cooling pillows are a great idea. Um, and the one other thing that really is helpful uh, is keeping your room cool at night. Um, and there's been research on this. Research has shown that if you keep the room cool in the beginning of the night, um, it's actually even more important than later on in the night. And I'm a strong advocate of people getting uh, dual control electric blankets, please. Because what happens in a lot of cases, uh, the woman, whether she's undergoing chemotherapy induced menopause or just spontaneous menopause can get real hot at night. She wants to throw off all her clothes or she'll yank the, the covers off the bed and her partner will freeze. So dual control electric blankets, very important. Okay, then we can talk about some of the other medications and other options that we have. Believe it or not, SSRI and SNRI antidepressants, yes, they're good antidepressants, but they also have a nice side effect of lowering hot flashes, making hot flashes less of a presence. So if somebody's having some depression and menopausal symptoms, maybe an ideal therapy. Gabapentin is another medication that some of you are familiar with um, as far as like for being good for nerve pain, you know, okay. Um, and also can be uh, good for seizures, stuff like that, but it's also good for hot flashes. So gabapentin is something that we may talk about, you know, okay, for our patients. Black cohosh or Simicifu gerasimosa, as it's known in the trade, is a very good herb for uh, hot flash therapy. It's been known for many, many years. It's actually, the plant is actually a Native American plant, um, which has been known in among Native American groups to be good for a lot of women's issues, particularly hot flashes. One of the problems we have with herbal therapies in the United States, unfortunately, is contrary to having something like the FDA, which is able to take charge of our medications that are available, unfortunately, there is no FDA for herbal products. And as I, Joanna knows this, I always say, I could go out and dig out some dirt from outside the office here and give it to you and tell you it's black cohosh and nobody's going to stop me. Um, whereas in places like Germany, they throw you in jail if you do stuff like that, which is, I think, what should happen. But anyway, um, so we actually tend to use a couple of black cohosh products from Germany, which were imported to the U.S. because I know that they're well regulated and we get the real stuff. Um, and one of the products that we use a lot of is something called um, Remy Femin, uh, which is a German product. And they also happen to make a product called Remy Femin Goodnight, which not only has the sleeper, it has the uh, black cohosh, but it also has some sleep herbs, some valerian, some lemon balm hops, um, and it's good for sleep. So on that, you can get on amazon.com, used widely in German breast cancer centers, uh, and we use it a lot, and we seem to have pretty good efficacy for many of our patients. There's also a Swedish pollen extract out there. This is a Swedish policed product, um, which works nicely for many women. Um, and the use of one thing does not necessarily preclude the use of the other. So we have some women who take an SSRI and Remy Femin or something like that. So we have a lot of different options out there for folks. And just I want to mention one drug for the future. Okay. And it's not here yet. They're in phase three trials. Um, and the trials look very promising that there is something called a neurokinin 3B receptor antagonist out there. You say that's a mouthful and it is. But these are actually, this is talking about the hypothalamus, right in the back of sort of bottom and back of the brain here, where the heat sensors are. Well, anyway, that, that basically that's where we think the temperature dysregulation occurs. And there are these uh, neurokinin 3B receptors, which if blocked, uh, can stop hot flashes. And it's very nice. Um, and it's not hormonal. So I am really eagerly awaiting the day when we have access to these medications for breast cancer survivors because, yeah, SSRIs are nice. Gabapentin is nice, got a lot of nice stuff. But unfortunately, some of those drugs may have some side effects that could be annoying to certain people. Whereas the nice thing about the NK3Rs is they do not seem to have much in the line of side effects. So I'm going to say stay tuned, stay tuned. Not here yet, but I'm hoping in a year or two we'll have access for folks for them. So I'm I'm very excited about the prospect there. We have the next slide there, Joanna. 
And again, one of the other things that we deal with besides dealing with hot flashes, which unfortunately many of you are probably familiar with, we deal with what's called genitourinary syndrome of menopause. And I alluded to this a little bit before because women can get dryness in the vagina, but they can also get bladder symptoms. And as you can see from this little schema here, the bladder is sitting right next to the vagina. Okay, there's no space between them. They are literally attached. Okay, and so that when and it's lined by the same kind of tissue. So when the vagina is getting dry, the bladder is getting dry, and that's why we like to talk about the genital urinary syndrome of menopause, not just talking about dry vaginas. The good news is is that we can help with the symptoms of both. So we have options for both. Now, what do we have as far as options? We have a lot of things. Okay, um, we have, and many women will know about vaginal lubricants, things that they may have used for ages at the time of sex to facilitate sexual activity and make things more smooth and, and slippery stuff. Um, however, one of the things that many women are not familiar with is the concept of vaginal moisturizers. And moisturizers are products that we place in the vagina two, three times a week, maybe even a little more frequently than that, which are long acting. And yes, we can use uh, estro vaginal estrogen, we'll talk about that in a minute, but we have many vaginal moisturizers, which are not hormonal, you know, okay, polycarbophil products like Remy Femin or a product we like also a lot called Reverie, which is made from hyaluronic acid like ladies put on their faces. Well, we can have them put it in their vaginas and it works very nicely. One other a little trick that we can do is if somebody's very uncomfortable with penetration with intercourse. Now, of course, we're encouraging moisturizers and lubricants and we don't just want to mask everything. But Putting a little Novocaine jelly, lidocaine jelly around the opening to the vagina can be very, very helpful. And again, when I start talking about this, some of our patients get nervous, but I say, you know, when you go to the dentist and, you know, she or he will, you know, apply some Novocaine and they're like, she's giving me shots in my vagina. That's all I need. No, this is to take a little bit of the gel that the dentist will often rub on your gums before they put the needle in. So the needle won't hurt. Well, this is the same sort of stuff that we can use. Another thing that we like a lot are vibrators, you know, Okay, because vibrators, non-hormonal, they increase pelvic blood flow and anything that increases pelvic blood flow is good for sex. And it's also good for moisture in the vagina. So we like, we like vibrators a lot. Now, unfortunately, some women, if they haven't had sex for a while, will find that their vaginas narrow down a little bit. Well, we want them to stretch. And those gadgets you see on the sign there on the right are what we call vaginal dilators to help stretch the vagina. And do they work? Yes, they can work very, very nicely. And as Joanna and I always tell people that indeed the diet, there are many, there are not many, there are some women, unfortunately very few, who are actually born without a vagina and they can actually use dilators to create a new vagina. So it works, it works. These things work. They can be very successful. Vaginal estrogen is something that can be discussed. I mean, okay, we have very good data that the amount of estrogen that gets absorbed vaginally is very small. Now, some oncologists are uncomfortable with the use of vaginal estrogen. And I always tell people, we always tell people, Joanne and I, that we need to check with the uh, particular oncologist as far as they are feeling. But, and we always encourage use of non-hormonal products first, as we talked about under the moisturizers. But there are certain situations where vaginal estrogen may well be used. And a, and a question that we all get asked very regularly because this is becoming more popular throughout the world is vaginal laser therapy, or as I always do my best Austin Powers imitation laser therapy. But the thing is that it's, it's unfortunately, it's, it's not super well tested yet. There really aren't a lot of what we call prospective randomized double blind trials. There are some issues with laser. There aren't licensure procedures. So for example, some people can just say I'm a laserologist and they may know nothing about what they're talking about. So I have a few friends we can send you to um, who are very good at it, um, but that is an option that's available in some places. We'll go to the next slide there, Joanna. Okay. And of course, some of the other consequences of menopause are indeed more challenging. And we talked already about the sleep disruption and we can talk about sleep herbs. Um, exercise is fabulous for just about everybody. We also encourage people, as Joanna has this lovely picture, that exercise does reduce menopausal symptoms in cancer survivors and also exercising early in the day. Late in the day may make you a little bit more awake, but early in the day is really terrific to get people a better night's sleep. Unfortunately, one of the things our patients can complain about with menopause pause without chemo and stuff like that, or things like uh, brain fog that we're just not totally into what's going on and executive function issues, things like that. But there are physical exercises that can be helpful, cognitive exercises that can help. And just like the uh, a psychiatrist will treat something like ADHD with stimulant therapy, some people 
treat the brain fog of menopause with things like that. And psychiatrists can be very helpful along those lines too. And we also, we always offer, you know, consults with our uh, psychotherapy people to see if they need some folks need some help along those lines. And as long as bone, as, as far as bone loss, um, one thing we do know is that weight bearing and balance exercises are good for us period. And also good to help prevent bone loss, calcium and vitamin D we recommend to most everybody. And then there are medical therapies that we can use if necessary. Necessary. So we keep an eye on bone densities in all of our patients. And if it looks like the bones are not behaving super well, we got a lot of good options available for them. Okay. And again, so what are the more challenging? Well, there are some issues with cardiovascular risks. We do know that women who go through early menopause do have a higher risk of heart disease. But of course, we want to really encourage a heart healthy lifestyle. And Joanna's an expert on talking about all of those issues and exercise for just about everybody if they can possibly do it. There are some issues with loss of sex drive. Not everybody has a loss of sex drive. So it's not strictly related to loss of estrogen or loss of testosterone. Um, but there are things that we can do. There's one product that we'd like a lot. Uh, and yes, honest to God, the uh, agent in it that makes for the nitric oxide is something called French maritime pine bark extract. You may say, well, the tri trip to France to get it would be pretty good too. Probably. Yes, maybe not right now. Um, there are also gadgets called clitoral stimulation devices um, related, to the, related to the vibrators, but not exactly. Um, and there are arousal oils that people use, um, which can be very helpful. And we have some uh, products and some websites we can send you to. And as far as the achiness of the joints, again, exercise, it sounds like I'm a broken record, exercise, exercise, but it's pretty good for just about everything. Can help with the joint aches. There are some topical therapies, uh, things like Voltaren gel and things like that can be helpful. And there are some herbal remedies. I'm, I'm a big nut on glucosamine and, and a moderate nut on turmeric, um, but there are some things that can be very helpful for folks. So, and those are fine to use. So we do have options. And again, this is some overlap perhaps between survivorship uh, approach programs and something like our SIMS program, but hey, everybody can help you. And that's important. Here we go to the next one, Joanna. And I'm going to leave it over to Joanna at this point, because she's going to take over on discussion of sexual health. Well, thank you, Dr. Minkin. And I know you're probably overwhelmed with a lot of information tonight, but Carrie did a great job of talking about how important it is to, to talk about sexuality and think about sexuality in our breast cancer survivors, because as I'll show you momentarily, there's just a lot of challenges for breast cancer patients in particular when it comes to sexual health. So menopause being one of the big challenges is just hormonally chemotherapy, um, ovarian suppression, and some of the endocrine therapy that you may be offered can certainly impact uh, sexuality. But sexuality in the cancer world is becoming more and more acknowledged as a very important part of quality of life for our survivorship patients. Um, so it's certainly something that we should be addressing with you. Your, your care team can ask about. Um, and if they don't, then feel free to bring it up because we know it's an important part of life for you. The reason that sexual uh, dysfunction or sexual challenges um, are particularly hard for breast cancer survivors is because there are so many factors involved, you know, in cancer in general, there's emotional factors. You have relationship challenges. Um, you have fertility challenges for our young patients who may think about loss of fertility or changes in fertility, um, body image and self-esteem, especially if breasts are erogenous zones for you and are important to your sexuality, whether you have a sexual partner or not. The breasts can be a very important part of your body image, and people may feel vulnerable during cancer treatment. Physical changes, of course, from surgery or radiation therapy, women who struggle with lymphedema or just have changes in range of motions. Oftentimes, if you've experienced breast surgery, you have a hard time moving your shoulders or putting weight on your arms for a period of time. And so that may impact sexual positioning or different um, ways that you have sex. We talked a lot about the hormonal changes which can impact the sex drive. And unfortunately, we're not good at, at mimicking sex drive naturally without giving you hormones, which we can't do in a lot of our breast cancer survivors. Um, and so just not to be redundant, but again, breast surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, endocrine therapy, our breast cancer survivors have many different treatment modalities 
And almost all of the treatment modalities, unfortunately, can affect your sex life. So um, breast surgery can, again, cause pain, scarring, body image challenges, lymphedema, um, pain and scarring from radiation. Those of you who've had radiation may experience, may know that, they, that there's a lot of fatigue associated with radiation. Chemotherapy, again, can put you into menopause. And, and what we didn't mention is that for young women, chemotherapy-induced menopause can sometimes be temporary. And after chemotherapy is over, the ovaries can at some point wake up again and give you a little bit more hormonal function again, not always. And again, the endocrine therapy can cause some hormonal side effects and even exacerbate the joint achiness that may be um, a part of your menopause journey. So again, I want you to know that it's okay to talk about sex. If your provider's not comfortable with it, come to see Dr. Minkin and I, because we're very comfortable. We like to talk about sexuality. We like learning about your sexuality and we see all ranges. We see people who don't have sex anymore, but are still uncomfortable. Uh, we see people who are in their 80s and 90s and still want to be sexual. So whatever your um, journey is, like Carrie said, we will meet you where you're at. Um, and, and we want to make sure that you feel comfortable talking about it. So if we don't bring it up, please bring it up for us. Um, sexuality really is interdisciplinary. You know, there are lots of people involved in helping you, your gynecologist, your oncology team. Uh, your mental health team, your social worker, um, a psychologist, and some young women also need a fertility specialist. But again, the patient and maybe a partner, if there is a partner in the picture, are at the middle of that uh, group of uh, uh, healthcare team. Uh, I won't spend too long on this just for the interest of time, but there's a lot of different ways we can manage sexual dysfunction. Um, we can talk about it, we can teach you about it and tell you about what's normal and how we can help you. Um, we can work with the psychology team to intervene. Uh, we can do a lot of the non-hormonal or non-prescription treatments that Dr. Minkin talked about. We can recommend those, give you some handouts and write down some ideas for you. Um, we can sometimes um, send prescriptions for some of the medications that require prescription therapy. And then we can refer you if needed to even somebody who is more specialized. So for us, sometimes we offer a referral to a pelvic floor physical therapist to help you with some relaxation exercises and stretching of the pelvic floor, working with the dilators, which we also can do in our clinic, but if Smilo is too far for you in New Haven, we can certainly help to find a pelvic floor physical therapist that's closer to home for you. Um, I will certainly let Kathy talk more about the psychological interventions that may help, but just talking about relationship challenges. A lot of our women really say, I feel guilty to my partner um, because my partner has been there to support me and I can't pleasure my partner. And we say, it's not your fault. You didn't do this. You didn't ask for this. This is your treatment that's affecting you. So, you know, we do have women saying, I feel guilt. And that's a really tough feeling to kind of deal with. So um, our, psych our psychology team can help you with those feelings and just kind of working through those partner dynamics. Um, and another thing that, that partners sometimes feel is a change in roles, you know, so, you know, partner, whether it be spouses or, or, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, or whoever your partner may be, you know, this may be a new role as a caregiver, as helping you with your medications or helping you recover from surgery. And it changes the dynamic of the relationship. So we have our wonderful psychology team that can help you. We talk a lot about behavioral modifications. This is one of my favorite pictures, and this is actually from the American Cancer Society. So I don't want you to feel like this is taboo to even look at this picture. Some people feel uncomfortable when I show them this picture, but I said, this is not the Kama Sutra. This is the American Cancer Society saying, you know, here are different things to try if the position that you're used to is just not working for you anymore for any reasons experiment, explore. It may be an opportunity to try new things, even if it's a little bit out of your comfort zone. Again, pelvic floor physical therapy may be very helpful for you. Um, you may have heard of something called Kegel exercises, and those are kind of where you squeeze the pelvic floor a little bit to kind of work on tightening 
and then relaxing those pelvic muscles and then tightening and relaxing. And those can help to train the muscles, not only to hold the urine if urinary urgency is a problem for you, but also to just kind of relax during intercourse. Um, but it's not easy to, to, to learn. Like Dr. Minkin talked about, we often recommend the lubricants and the moisturizers, the dilators, the sexual devices. And again, some women based on their personal experiences and their view of sexuality and culture may say, I really don't feel comfortable with trying some of these things and that's okay. You know, we, again, we'll meet you where you are. We can give you some resources if you wanna try new things, but if you're not comfortable, that's okay too. So just to summarize a little bit, and then we'll let you ask questions at the very end of the program tonight. Um, you know, menopause and sexuality is important to talk about. It's not always comfortable to talk about, but it really is, you know, our responsibility to, to talk to you and offer you support. So Dr. Minkin and I are here for our patients. Um, we are offering telemedicine visits, so you don't have to come down to New Haven. If you're up in the Waterford area, we're happy to chat with you by phone or video. Um, and we can kind of help with your visits with Carrie. If you need a little more discussion, we're happy to kind of chat about it um, because we know, and a lot of women don't realize the impact that a cancer diagnosis and treatment really has on their sexual life. So uh, lots of reasons why that is. Your body changes, your hormones change, your brain changes, your, more, you know, your emotions change with, with a cancer diagnosis and treatment, but we can work with you to make it better. So there's lots of resources available. And with that, I will uh, leave you with a, a few resources. I'm happy to share these offline um, another day. And thank you so much for your time. And we'll let uh, Kathy give a little bit more um, information. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Minkin and Joanna. That was great. And we are so fortunate to have your team available to our patients. Um, that's extraordinary. Thank you for all the help for them. So um, Kathy, I'm on. Um, can you see me? Now, if you can turn the camera on, that would be good. It's on. <laughs> oh, boy. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, I can hear you, but we cannot see you. Oh, darn. I don't know why, but maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> um, let me just see if I can figure out. Um, I know I know that this is a lot of information tonight, so I I just um, I'm just so happy to be here and ha and have this opportunity to be able to um, talk about things that we don't necessarily have a chance to talk about in the exam room. Um, and what I know is that attending tonight is a group of women that have been through an, an incredible journey. Um, all of you have gone through this in a different way but there is a lot that you share in common. Um, and it's, it's time to just give a chance to think about what your feelings are and what your heart and brain is saying and make sure that they are connecting in a way that keeps you feeling happy and vital in life. So um, I, I, um, I'm gonna ask to start off actually after all this information to kind of just do a little mindfulness exercise if we could. And so if we could just um, get in a comfortable position and whatever that be for you, whether your feet are grounded on the floor or they're crossed, whether your eyes are closed or open. Um, but I just wanna take a moment to kind of collectively breathe um, and whether that breath is deep breaths or shallow breaths, whatever is comfortable for you. Um, let's just breathe in and out together. Keep breathing in and out and just kind of aligning your thoughts and your feelings. And in this moment, just think about what feeling you have right now. It may be happy, it may be overwhelmed, it may be scared, sad. There's no wrong feeling. Breathing in and breathing out. 
and just kind of quieting that heart and calming yourself. And that simple mindfulness exercise of just kind of centering ourselves, the wonderful thing about it is we can do it many times during the day and it can help us bring ourselves to the center of what, what is going on for us. What is our feeling? And then why are we feeling it? And then kind of asking ourselves, is this feeling interfering with our life? Because when we begin to ask, let ourselves feel the feeling and ask ourselves those questions, we then begin to have a choice of whether we want to speak the feeling, share the feeling, or shove it back inside. And unfortunately, we know that in this cancer journey, all of your starts to it may have been different. You may have felt a lump. You may have been, a, a scan may have shown you, but the journey brings you to a side of life you may not ever have had before with a different medical jargon and all different kind of language and medical appointments and your calendar blows up. And honestly, there isn't time to feel. So you kind of learn to keep those in. And even if you feel the feeling, then you kind of feel like, I don't wanna worry my friends or family. So the shower becomes the resource for crying or the car after listening to a country song becomes where we can finally let it out in a way at least to release. But I think tonight I wanna to talk about just kind of really the healing that comes from in telling your story. And although talking about your diagnosis is a really personal decision, picking someone other than your village other than the family and friends that have walked the walk every day with you is really important. Um, someone who can listen and not judge, not necessarily give you any advice and just lets you talk. It's really important to do that. Um, you'll find that if you're able to allow yourself to feel the feeling and talk your story, you'll feel lighter. And it also will have the extra advantage of giving you a different perspective. You know, surrounding yourself with the right people are, are the key. And I think women are blessed with this incredible gut, but unfortunately we sometimes don't listen to it. And I think that if I could, I could gift you one thing, it would be to listen to that gut and give it a voice. Because if your gut tells you it isn't right, then it isn't right for you. Social media is another place where we can share our story. And it's, um, it can be a wonderful thing because there's a bonding that can happen over social media with, with people who may not have even met each other but have the same diagnosis. But I really am asking you to think before you post. Think about what you want people to know about you. Think about if someone did a web search, like an employer, an ex, or someone you have never met, would you want them to know your personal story? We sometimes forget that there's an ability to do privacy settings. They are so important. And we sometimes forget to tell our friends and families what we don't want posted. And so usurp your power, take control, and be able to kind of know the things that you want or, or don't want. It's an important step not to, not to miss. And then there's dating. Cancer treatments may affect your sexuality and the way you feel about your body. But if you feel well enough, you keep dating. You may feel some self-consciousness, but those are the things that will start to surface for you. And again, talk, talk to us, talk to other women, ask them how they do it, talk to, talk to, our, your medical team, and we can figure out strategies on how to help you. Um, and I guess the only takeaway for, for me of anything that I've said tonight is that you guys are not alone. You've learned and done things that you never imagined you could have done, and you've done it. And you are part of a group here tonight that knows exactly how you feel and has, has oftentimes been in your shoes. Um, 
So I guess this is my plug for support groups. <laughs> be daring, join a group, uh, learn from other women and be part of what they have learned. And the other thing is to kind of, you know, if you're beyond your treatment or you're starting to feel like you have the energy to start doing things you know, pay it forward, reach out, join something. It doesn't have to be cancer related, but be part of your community. We know that there's so much going on in our world right now. You know, it, it's been scientifically proven that if you do for others, it, it enriches you too. So it's a win-win for both. So um, I was going to read one little simple thing and then I'm going to end because I know there's lots of questions out there. Um, Sometimes we get so caught up in life that we forget that we don't always have to be busy. We don't always need to be checking our email or rushing to the next thing. We need to remind ourselves that it's okay and absolutely necessary to slow it all down, to take a break and enjoy nature, to turn off the TV and simply be together, to enjoy a game of cards, to ask our kids what they've been wondering about, to call our parents, to watch the sunrise, to enjoy the smell of a burning candle. We must never forget to enjoy the little things because they are never, never as little as we think. So that's, that's all for me. I'm the social worker from the Cancer Center and I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Kathy, that was wonderful, heartfelt and uh, emotional and wonderful. And we know how you are there for each and every one of our patients from the time of the diagnosis through different transitions in their treatment and life transitions and how you support them in a, the most wonderful way. So um, I think that that was a wonderful presentation and um, we do know that um, treating our patients every single day, we get inspired by uh, the courage and the, we learn from each patient. Um, we, we get inspired by the, how graceful they go through treatment and how they face their challenges. And we know that um, at the end of the uh, treatment, many patients find um, a new sense of purpose. They, have, uh, they may have this, what we call the post-traumatic growth. And I know that Carrie um, looked into that and I would invite her to talk a little bit more about it. Where we do know that some patients put their life on hold but once the treatment is over, they may attend those goals that they thought they lost or just put them aside for the, uh, during the acute treatment phase. Yeah, so when I was uh, doing my uh, research for this uh, presentation webinar tonight, I, I came across this concept of post-traumatic growth, which I had never heard about before. So this is something, a new concept to me and uh, that, um, and I just went down a rabbit hole into this and it's incredibly interesting. Um, so I'm just gonna, I have a slide for it, but I'm just, I'm just gonna read um, some information um, about what post-traumatic growth is. Um, so, um, Basically, people uh, going through cancer uh, may experience different types of growth um, while coping with the cancer, which could be improved relations with others, new life experiences, a, great, a greater appreciation for life, a sense of personal strength, spiritual development. Um, Post-traumatic growth, like post-traumatic stress um, is not universal and research shows that the following people are more likely to have post-traumatic growth. Those who generally adapt well to new experiences and challenges, those who keep a cheerful outlook 
And those who have a strong social support network, um, which kind of touches upon what Kathy was talking about. Um, uh, different ways to encourage personal growth, um, reducing anxiety, reflecting on your experience, restoring a sense of safety, um, which would involve considering uh, talking to supportive professionals, um, such as mental health providers, social workers, chaplains, spiritual advisors, and um, support groups. Uh, connecting with others and creating, and this is an interesting concept too, creating a post-trauma life vision. Think through what you have learned from your experience, then plan how you want to live more fully. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really beautiful uh, vision to have. Um, and probably something no one is thinking about while they're really going through treatment um but uh yeah i mean how do you want to live more fully and uh i think that's something we should all in general be focusing on thank you patty so You're there welcome. is a question if there is there could be uh post-traumatic growth with post-traumatic stress kathy do you want to touch on that well, I'm sure you can, because you could have a post-traumatic stress event from even just going through all the cancer treatments, but it also may be an opportunity for growth for you as well. Yeah, I, and um, not to interrupt you, Kathy, but uh, there was just that one more thing on my slide that I didn't even mention good. that kind of answers that question. Oh, good, good, good. good. Um, so... You, it says, even with post-traumatic growth, you may feel stress and negative feelings. Growth and suffering can happen at the same time. In fact, most people who report post-traumatic growth also report having struggles. So I think it, it is, um, we can definitely experience both at the same time. I think it's so, through our hardest times. We learn so much about ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously what, all of you have gone through um, is a testimony to that. The, the way I've heard it described is some, some people go through cancer and it's very detrimental to their mental health and their personal health. Some people go through cancer and it doesn't phase them. And some people go through cancer and they become a, a different person in a positive way. So really there's three different outcomes and some of it I think can be intentional and some of it is the way our body and our mind reacts, but, but there's three different outcomes of cancer treatment. It happened, it broke me or it strengthened me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we as a team, um, as the survivorship team involving so many different subspecialties, we are trying to foster a positive outcome after the cancer experience. Uh, with emphasis on the healthier life, life um, style, the, the importance of exercise and diet, the positive mindset, and really uh, learning from the challenge and um, taking it to the next level. You know, um, there's the poet said at the beginning, an empowered uh, girl can paint, is a hurricane painting the world in better colors the same way an empowered breast cancer survivor or a cancer survivor in general could really um, achieve extraordinary um, successes in multiple aspects of their lives by uh, strengthening relationships or really figuring um, what's important for them, finding purpose and meaning in their life. I think mm -hmm. that's how I would like to say. Um, so I would, there is a question um, in the chat, uh, low libido is such a challenge. I feel nothing even with toys, lubricants, currently on tamoxifen, any advice? Can I take it? <laughs> sure. 
Okay. So um, we got a lot of stuff that we can talk about here. Um, one of the therapies that, I mean, low libido is, is a real, unfortunately, and, and the causes of libido loss are multifactorial. It's hard to say discomfort, uh, hormonal changes, environmental changes, all sorts of stuff. But one thing, of course, is to make sure you're as comfortable as possible. So if somebody has had discomfort with intercourse, I would strongly encourage use of some moisturizers to get the vagina comfortable using lubricants with sex to try to be, or if using gadgets, vibrators, things like that, to be as comfortable as possible. I would not give up on the vibrators um, because anything that increases pelvic blood flow is probably going to ultimately help with libido. So keep using them. Don't give up on them yet. You know, okay. Um, Dr. Ruth is a great believer in uh, things like the fantasies. Um, so keep up those fantasies. Don't give them up. Um, and one thing Dr. Ruth always says is don't tell your partner about fantasies you're thinking about because your real partner can't match up to the fantasies, <laughs> except she says it in such a charming accent. Anyway, um, now, as far as other medication type things to use, there are some topical things, some non-hormonal approaches. Um, one or some as, as a variant of the arousal oil root. There's a product I think is still available called Zestra, Z-E-S-T-R-A, over-the-counter non-prescription, which you can rub on the vulvar area, and it's supposed to enhance local responsiveness um, used at the time of sex. And, um, and the theory is, well, if you have a better response, you'll want to have sex more. Well, that makes logical sense. Another product that's out there that is totally non-hormonal is, and we alluded to this before, it's talking about the French maritime pine bark. Um, it's a product called Ristella, R-I-S-T-E-L-A. Uh, it's two tablets a day, it's totally non-hormonal. And what it basically leads to is the uh, maritime pine bark supposedly enhances the production of nitric oxide, which helps dilate your pelvic blood vessels. And supposedly, if you've got more blood throwing, flowing through your pelvis, you'll think about sex more. Well, that's a logical thought. And there is some literature, scientific literature to support it. I don't say we have a ton of literature, but there is some. So that's certainly an option. Non-hormonal people can't argue about you taking it. Unfortunately, things like estrogen and testosterone, testosterone more is a libido enhancer than say estrogen, but most folks don't push using it because of the hormonal potential, you know, consequences. However, by the, the comment that is made that you're on tamoxifen, I'm assuming that you're premenopausal. There are a couple of medications which are specifically for libido improvement in premenopausal women. One is a pill that you may have heard about. It's a daily pill, and people were for a while referring to it as the pink Viagra. It's a pink pill. Um, and it basically is flabanserin or a D, A D D Y I. It's non hormonal. It's a medication you take every day and is supposed to be for people, anybody who's got decreased libido premenopausally. Um, and it does seem to have effect. I mean, the FDA has approved it for increased libido. So that's an option that's out there, non-hormonal and people can take it. The other option that's out there, there is a medication called, and that's a prescription drug. There is a prescription medication called Vileci, V-Y-L-E-E-S-I, which is, and now some people are going to groan when I say this, it's a shot. <laughs> so no, we're not shooting you up in your vulva there or anything like that, but it's like an EpiPen sort of thing is really what it looks like. And you sort of pop this EpiPen thing, which is really this drug called Vileci. Okay. And what it is, it's supposed to act centrally in the brain to increase libido. And it works within 45 minutes to an hour, hour and a half, something like that. But it lasts for about 12 hours or so. So it's not just, it's going to be gone in an hour and a half and that it does increase libido. Again, and the data has shown it. The, the, the data is, is, you know, real. It's FDA approved. Um, it's not dramatic, but it does seem to do it. The advantage of something like the Vileci shot is that you can take it when you want to have sex. So you say, okay, it's Saturday night. I'm going to be with my partner. Yeah, we want to have sex. We'll shoot up with the Vileci. Whereas the ADE is a medication you need to take on a daily basis. Um, all of those are non-hormonal. All of those are reasonable options. Uh, unfortunately, a uh, major side effect is probably your pocketbook um, because they are expensive. Insurance does some coverage, um, but there are tricks to, to get around doing it. So those are for premenopausal women. So we do have some stuff in our armamentarium here, which is non-hormonal, which can help. I hope that's helpful. Another thing to consider too, to add to Dr. Minkin's answer is um, exploring with your team if any of your other medications that you take may impact your sex drive. 
Um, so again, while, while we love some of the antidepressants for some of their factors, they may impact sex drive. And then also kind of figuring out whether the issue is with the desire or is with orgasm, because there are some women who say, I have a lot of desire, but I just can't reach a climax. I can't reach orgasm. And so we kind of tease out where the issue is and how we can best help you to target that issue. That is uh, very good information. Thank you very much. So I would um, make a, a comment about um, supplements and um, especially herbal supplements. There is a wonderful app from Memorial Sloan Catering accompanied by a website actually, where there is a lot of information about uh, herbal supplements and interaction with different medications and um, um, treatment in general. So I think that it's, it's good to look there. So for instance, for black cohosh, they question if it could potentially decrease the risk of uh, the metabolism of tamoxifen. And um, it may not be necessarily recommended during the chemo with uh, doxorubicin and docetaxel because it could increase the level of the, the medication. So I think that the key is to um, discuss the, the options with the um, with treating provider and to ensure that, um, thank you very much, <laughs> Joanna, for putting that there. And uh, as I said, it's a free app. Uh, it's called About Earths. Yeah. Can I actually, can I ask a question to Dr. Please. Minkin? Just sure. to go. <laughs> um, going back uh, to the, the question that was just previously asked regarding um, libido and um, different uh, ways to manage that. And um, so I've been asked this by patients um, for regarding clitoral stimulation, CBD, topical CBD cream or oil. Can you comment on that at all? The answer is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> there ain't much data out there. Yeah. So I can make a comment. Yeah, it's probably all right. I yeah. mean, again, it's, it's unlikely to be harmful. Um, the part right. of the problem is, again, in standardization. You know, there is very little, like, no standardization of the various CBD products that are out there. So we really have very little idea of what folks are getting mm. um, in their products. So it's unlikely it's going to be a problem, but we just don't have a lot of data out there for folks, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I would encourage if there are any other questions, this would be a good moment. Raise them. Um, so if not, I would like to um, thank you, our great panelists for um, for a fantastic hour um, in celebrating our breast cancer survivors. Um, we are so happy that you are part of our team. We, we do have a local um, team in Waterford for the survivorship program integrated to the larger network um, with a team from uh, Guilford and New Haven. Um, so uh, I know that Dr. Minking and Joanna, you, you've helped so many of our um, patients and we will keep referring them to you. We're happy um, to help. We're delighted to be of assistance, yes. So I would just want to show one, um, share one last pic um, picture. It's um, of, from our, oh, I'm sorry. Hi, this is a I'm sorry. Okay, of our um, healing garden. I'm sorry, well, it doesn't work. But anyway, uh, to say that we are encouraging uh, communication. We hope that um, this session helped um, break some biases and uh, to encourage people to 
bring out issues that may interfere with their quality of life, with their sense of well-being during this um, path, uh, during this time of um, transition from um, illness to wellness. And uh, we, as a multidisciplinary team, are here to help uh, with the greatest of care. And with that, um, I'd say, um, let's break the bias. And um, thank you very much, it, every one of you for participating and happy International Women's Day. And let's break the bias. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.